JFY Networks is dedicated to helping young people prepare for the future by engaging teachers, students, and parents in achieving grade level and college ready skills. We strive to help all involved in the education process attain equitable achievement and readiness for post high school education and careers through best practices for teaching and learning in hybrid, remote, and in-person modalities. We offer high quality online core instruction augmented by extensive supplementary resources, all supported by training and coaching by our experienced learning specialists. For more information, go to our website, jfynet.org. During this past year, we have explored relevant and topical educational issues each month. In today's podcast, we'll take a look back at some of the memorable moments from our 2020 podcasts. Our focus will be on how teachers adjusted to the school shutdown. There's a weekly schedule and each teacher has an hour set aside for office hours for each of their courses. Then we also have two days, Thursday and Friday, that have a half hour class meeting time. The frustration felt by students forced into online only classes during the spring school shutdown. That's all being, like that opportunity is being taken away from me and it feels almost fake to have these classes on Zoom. But also how educational progress continued even while in-person learning was delayed. Our proposed competency-based academic program is an evidence-based alternative to a traditional Carnegie unit credit earning system. And how the issue of social justice required further focus. How many during this pandemic, especially here in Boston, just using Boston as the litmus test. I mean, how many families couldn't, you know, they didn't have their own pieces of technology, let alone the internet services. So now your child is getting further and further and further behind. This podcast was created by JFY Networks, a Boston-based nonprofit provider of online learning programs to schools, students, and parents. JFY's individualized self-paced curricula help raise individual and school performance measures by maintaining grade level skills and combating learning loss. JFY provides online ELA and math curricula aligned to state and college standards from grades five through high school with personal support online and via telephone from friendly learning specialists like yours truly. For JFY Networks, I'm Greg Cunningham. The COVID-19 virus dominated the news during 2020, and the JFY Net podcast reflected this focus. When schools first shut down in March, we interviewed Dr. Michael Maripati, Dean of Online Programming at Cambridge College, and asked how teachers could adjust from the physical front lines in the classroom to a remote online platform. Well, I recently read an article, I think it was just yesterday, about the fact that we are probably not doing classic online education right now, but we're doing crisis education. So moving things into an online platform does not, in effect, establish an online course. Uh, That takes quite a bit of energy and the work of uh, learning designers and uh, assessment designers, content experts, It can take five or six months or more to develop a well put together online class. What we're asking instructors to do now is to move enough of their information and enough of their material online to keep the students engaged in the short term. We're not asking them to record lectures. We're not asking them to create interactive uh, elements or simulations. All of these things would be present in a well-designed online class. At this point, what we're asking from our instructors is that they produce some information for the students to respond to, whether that's reminding them of a chapter in the textbook to read, perhaps a PDF of a journal article, a video that they can watch that supports the learning objectives, and then to craft a discussion question and then a follow-up assignment. Very, very basic elements And as long as the instructor is comfortable using the learning management system, they shouldn't have any problem with the content. Educators found ways to connect with students. As featured in our April podcast, teachers Rachel Silva and Lisa Honeyman and special education paraprofessional Charlotte Bacuzzi discussed moving classroom help and instruction to an online platform. I think with 
Google Classroom, what's been really great about it is that they don't have to respond to me as as if they would face to face, you know, so they're so used to texting. And what I like about it so far is I've been having some really great conversations with them through Google Classroom, like even just leaving messages back and forth to each other. They had to write a reflection on how this particular time of their life has changed them. And some of them were really sad. And I feel really bad, you know, for what they've been going through. And I feel like the time has been flying. But I also have a house to and a yard to go out to, you know, the kids that live in the apartments here, I feel really bad for like they feel like they're stuck, you know, and I think hearing from them, but then them hearing back from me, like a few of them have been like super nice and we miss you. And like, you don't get that in person sometimes at the high school level, you know, so I think they really do miss school. I found it really interesting to read a whole bunch of them saying, I never thought I'd say this, but I really miss school. And they just miss the interaction with people. So I I feel bad. And But at the same time, I think that the technology is helping, you know, keep that communication. If we didn't have any, I think it would be a lot worse. So for those of them that have communicated, it's been really good for them too, like not just us, but for them. There's a weekly schedule and each teacher has an hour set aside for office hours for each of their courses. So I I have two hours set for office hours, one hour for my junior honors class and one hour for my AP statistics classes. Then we also have two days, Thursday and Friday, that have a half hour class meeting time for each course. And it's structured the same way our schedule is during the school the school year when we're physically present. And the reason we have Thursday and Friday is uh, many of our classes meet four times a week, but we also have elective classes that meet twice a week. And we the elective classes will meet either Thursday or Friday. And then the the full-time classes, the ones that meet four times a week, the teacher can pick whether it's going to meet on Thursday or Friday. And in some cases, they're choosing to meet both, especially for like AP classes. They're definitely taking more responsibility for themselves. They are learning time management because they have certain things they need to get done. A lot of them tend to get their work done in the morning. Um, so they're able to go outside, play on their trampoline, go for a walk, um, go bake brownies with their grandmother or something like that. They they tend to structure their day so that they do get to have those break times in the afternoon. Um, but that definitely depends on the parental rules in the house. So that 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 seems to be working well. They are definitely in charge of their learning. They are in the driver's seat, I guess, in a way, and they are they are learning how to structure their day and their their learning process. While students made the best of a challenging situation, they were frustrated at times, as these students from Needham High School and Durfee Academy in Fall River indicated during our early April podcast. I think that it's, it's not, I don't say, I'm not going to say it's not completely right for them to be assigning work for us to, obviously we need to be getting something done, but the way, the way that they're, they, they sh- it should be more coordinated, so we should have some yeah. math, English, because a lot of it now is just every, every teacher has their own, they submit their own stuff, so you could have six, eight, there'll be days where you have six assignments, and there'll be days, there'll be like four days in a row where you'll have nothing. Right? Senior year, you know, we go through senior fall, and I hate to, I, I don't want to like be a fear monger, but in my opinion, it was as bad, if not worse, than junior spring, at least for me. And then, you know, we get through all the hard stuff, and basically right when it's supposed to get good, you know, right when everything we did for the last four years is supposed to like be okay, and we can just, you know, enjoy being with our friends, that's when the pandemic happens. So I think the general mood for a lot of people in my grade is just sort of, you know, sadness mixed with bitterness. We did everything that everyone else did, except we don't have, we probably won't have a prom, we won't have a traditional graduation, we won't have a bunch of senior events that typically make all that other stuff okay. It's been quite difficult. Uh, I still have contact with the teachers uh, by the app called Zoom. Uh, it's a video call app, uh, but it's just once a week, and most of the times I'm not available at that time that they are available. Uh, and when I do, I don't understand that much of the work, and it's been uh, challenging. So since we do not have um, <clears throat> a term four going, uh, gonna be, there's not going to be a term four this year. It's, they're just extending term three. Um, all of the assignments that they put out, they are required. Um, and if you just don't do them, then it's going to really affect your grades and possibly won't graduate. Other teachers, um, they post work every day, and it's uh, due by the end of the week. As schools extended the shutdown throughout the spring, student anxiety increased, especially about college acceptances 
when more and more SAT testing dates were canceled. This is obviously not an ideal scenario. Definitely not my favorite thing that's happened. I feel like as a junior, this is supposed to be the time when we're kind of really doing the most work. It's supposed to be one of the most stressful times of high school. And it's kind of weird because it's really not stressful in the traditional ways. Like we're not as stressed about AP exams because they're kind of irrelevant at this point. Um, I know for me, like I had spent a lot of time prepping for the March SAT, uh, like a lot of time. And when that got canceled, that was like, honestly, one of the things that bummed me out the most, because I felt like I had put a lot of time and effort into that. And I don't get to show my effort there. I had tons of college tours canceled. I'm actually supposed to be seeing Northwestern right now, like on campus right now. But obviously, I'm not there. So that kind of stinks because we won't get to see as many schools, but hopefully we'll get to see them next year. I, like Maggie, was supposed to take the March SAT, and I definitely didn't study as much as Maggie did. But I still needed to take that test because for obvious reasons, like college admissions. And then it got canceled. Seeing that the June SAT also got canceled and being so uncertain about how that's going and seeing that SAT may be online now, it's just freaking me out so much because as Maggie mentioned, college admissions is a huge thing for all the juniors. And a lot of schools haven't gone test optional yet. Some schools are, but it's a lot of uncertainty around that specific area of like the college admissions process. Also, Maggie touched on this too, junior spring is supposed to be this like, really intense, really hard part of junior year, and you're supposed to get a ton of work done. And I was really looking forward to that. And just seeing all of this effort that I'm going to put into junior spring pay off in the end. And now that's all being like that opportunity is being taken away from me. And it feels almost fake to have these classes on zoom and like, do this work that doesn't feel as real and see like 45 minute long AP exams replacing three hour tests that we were supposed to take. And I feel really bad for the kids who paid a ton of money for AP exams, and now aren't going to be able to take like the real deal tests. So all of that just makes it feel like we're not ending up in a place where we're supposed to be because we're not putting as much effort in. And classes are definitely super, super weird right now. In August, when it became clear that schools would still struggle to return to full in-person learning, we spoke to Dr. James Weaver, the Director of Performing Arts and Sports from the National Federation of State High School Associations about the importance of finding a way to continue extracurricular activities when in-person learning options were limited. Really on the athletic end, we're looking at a lot of modifications during the scheduling. What can we do to kind of maybe push this back until we get better control of it? Uh, or what can we do like in the golf setting, right? Like, can we just do instead of four sums doing golfing, can we do two sums doing golfing and spread those students out farther to kind of keep those programs going? In our world of the performing arts area, we have uh, like speech, debate, music, uh, theater is a little bit more tricky. But in those other three, what can we do to get them virtual? Uh, because, for example, like I live in Indiana. Indiana has tens upon tens of thousands of students participating in the music programs. So what can they do, like for the state level programs? So what can they do to continue that on? And how does that work in a virtual format? And then we get into what copyright issues we have to deal with, uh, which is a thing. And then what do we do to make sure that... <clears throat> students have a safe online environment to compete in uh, and all those kinds of uh, thought processes we need to go in there. And that's what we're seeing a lot of our performing arts area activities do when they have are going online, you know, so, but it's working for them so far. And they're kind of, they're trying to keep their schedule intact as much as they can. The other interesting part about that too, is what do you do, uh, which I think is something that's important for people to think about. What do you do when we have schools in session and we want to host a state marching band or a one act play festival or a, mar a debate tournament. So kids can go to their school, but we have no host school to host these festivals and contests. And that's where we're seeing some of our focus on the online aspect go to is what that looks like. So can we figure out a way with, like we have an NFHS network, for example, can we figure out a way to broadcast all those different components so that way uh, adjudicators can see what these things are doing, get them adjudicated, get them the state assessment levels that a lot of states rely on, get those evaluations back to the schools and then continue the cycle of what we normally do. And so we're trying to figure out some of those things as well. While COVID-19 was having a major impact on education, 2020 also saw a rebirth of involvement in the issue of social justice. 
In February, in honor of Black History Month, we were honored to speak to Satina Wright, an English as a Second Language teacher for English language learning students at Madison Park Technical Vocational High School in Boston, about how she incorporated into her lessons great African-American leaders who have a local connection. And the first American, the, the first black American that we're focusing on is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his time here and experiences here in Boston. And one of the things that the students are learning are his personal address of where he lived, which was he resided in an apartment at 397 Massachusetts Avenue in the south end part of Boston. And he did that as he was attending Boston University as a theology major and he was studying to receive his Ph.D. Also, he visited Roxbury in his time as well. Once he graduated, he visited Roxbury. He visited the State House because he wanted to speak against segregation, and he spoke against segregation in the Boston Public Schools, actually. One major factor of his time here in Boston, besides him receiving his education here, was that he met his wife here, Coretta Scott King who was also a student. She was studying at the New England Conservatory of Music here in Boston, and they met through a mutual friend and got to know each other, and they decided to go to Alabama and get married, and then they returned to Boston to both complete their studies, and then after that, they closed up shop and went on back. Um, so that was something to me that was really crucial to have my students who need to know about American history and about black history because they are not from this country and I still actually have a few students who have never heard of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, they were not studying him in their countries before they arrived here. They're newcomers to the country. So the information that they're receiving is something to me that is um, important to their learning, um, important to American history and important to local history because this is where they live. This is where their families have chosen to settle. And there has been a lot of historical events that have happened in the places, some of the places that they've probably frequented themselves and they just had no idea. Um, and I like to be able to give my students something that they can connect to. You know, if I say that he lived on Mass Avenue next to Mass Ave train station, then that's something that they can, it's very relatable to them. You know, they can pass by there and maybe they can tell others about it as well. The street on which Madison Park is located is called Malcolm X Boulevard. This was a significant factor when Ms. Wright decided to highlight his local connections for her students. And the second black American that we are focusing on is Malcolm X. And our school is located on Malcolm X Boulevard. And that's a reason why I chose the next black American to study to be Malcolm X. Um, I felt that also they needed to know the local history about his time here, where he lived. He lived in Roxbury on Dale Street. He was in Dudley Square very often, which is now Nubian Square, is where he hung out. He did have a life of crime in the beginning of his young life. Um, he served time in Norfolk. And it was inside there, as he was serving his prison time, that he started to connect with someone inside there who was a practicing Muslim and a member of the Nation of Islam. And they, he told him about Honorable Elijah Muhammad and he, he sparked his interest. And by then he was cleaning himself up and getting more knowledgeable about himself. And so when he got out, he had already had connections to meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in person and start his journey and left, if I'm not mistaken, left Boston by that point to go and um, pursue other things that they had planned for him at the Nation of Islam. And so I want the students to be able to take from that that there is a reason why their schools located on Malcolm X Boulevard and there's a reason why there is a major park called Malcolm X Park in Roxbury and that park is actually on Martin Luther King Boulevard in Roxbury as well. And there are reasons why these names are here because you know they made an impact in a very small community and there were a lot of people that are black Americans that maybe are senior citizens at this point but they have firsthand experience of these things. Also Malcolm X was a person that 
got when he got out of jail he spent time in the nation of islam a little bit here with the members here and would get his hair cut in roxbury also at my grandfather's barbershop which was um, bo nubian bromel a nubian notion incorporated it had two names and inside there it that barbershop provided a safe space for a lot of the black americans in that time period and Nation of Islam, Black Americans also that frequent in that place to be able to get their haircuts, to be able to discuss things safely, to be able to bring their families there and just connect and network. And it was very much an institution there as far as civil rights, as far as, you know, anything that was going on in, in the black part of Boston or residents in Boston who were black. There was a lot of information that got exchanged there and everybody could safely come together there and talk and get together and then leave and you know see you next week or see you next every other week or whenever they came that was something that was also a part of his life my grandfather actually cut his hair deval patrick also used to go in there and get his hair cut by my dad so it was just a lot of times between the mid 60s on to about i want to say maybe the early 90s where a nubian notion bold Bo Brummel was a place where a lot of the uh, black Americans and males would come in there and, and gather and, and get their haircuts. Conversations concerning social justice continued throughout the year. JFY Net Executive Director Gary Kaplan interviewed Kevin McCaskill, the Executive Director of Madison Park Technical Vocational High School, the only vocational high school in the Boston public school system. They discussed the history of social justice in the American education system. Well, I, I want to see with, with Brown, if, if I can digress a bit. Yeah, Gary, sure. About, Go ahead. About, about, about Brown. <laughs> yeah. I think the intentions of Brown were good. Yeah. But there was a residual consequence that occurred because as the schools were supposed to integrate with students, it didn't integrate the educators. And thousands upon thousands of oh. books educators did not work. They weren't integrated into schools. And so when we talk about today, about why aren't Blacks and Latinx individuals getting into teaching, well, that's a residual effect because after you've lost your job, if I was a principal at a Black school and all of a sudden my school, all the students are leaving because of integration, I don't have a job anymore. So, and white schools weren't quick to hiring me, hiring us, so now, what's the taste in, in, in educators' mouths right now? What's that taste about their kids coming up? Don't be an educator because they won't take you. Wow. They won't take you. We lost generations of future and prospective Black and Latinx educators. And it wasn't the, and trust me, that wasn't the intent on No, that. but. But it, but it occurred. It, are there uh, are there data that that support that that uh, I mean there are books that you, are, there are books I can you know it's, it's a book that I'm reading that's, now yeah of uh, what it's by Derek Bell oh yeah uh, and it's oh god what is it? yeah 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 a it's recent silent book covenant, silent covenants he wrote it back into I think it's, it's a book is I mean he wrote it back in I want to say 2005 2006 I'm uh -huh. reading it but he mentions it but it's, it's I mean that stuff you can look it up and it's yeah. all it's documented. Well, that is incredible. That's very interesting. I have never heard that before. I've never thought of it before. It un but again, it's an unintended consequence. Sure. It's, it's a great thing. And sure. And the other, but what happens, the educators didn't come with it. And so, so now when we talk about, you know, that we don't have, we don't have individuals of color in this field. Well, that was set up, set up by, you know, by, Brown, by six, 66 uh, years ago. Yeah, that was set up by this. Yeah. And so again, I know when I said that I would had some interest in teaching and I want to go back, I'm going back to when I was in college. Yeah. And I really, I, I thought about it. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they was quickly dismissed by folks around me. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You're not really? going to you're not going to make any money doing that. I mean, my first salary, I can tell you my exact salary <laughs> in 1988, $19,192. <laughs> <laughs> My first salary. It's like it was yesterday. That's more but, than you're making today. <laughs> yeah. If you put it by an hourly rate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but so now we fast forward. Yeah. The round was supposed to be that litmus test of, of integration and getting yeah, yeah. the mix. Schools are more segregated now. I mean, it's well documented. Schools are more segregated now than they ever were. And it's, and it's so unfortunate. We look at some of our urban school and not just here in Boston or Springfield or Hartford where I've been, but you look across the country. You know, our most neediest kids go to go to, quote unquote, those schools that aren't good. Yeah. It's because yeah. the needs are so high. Yeah. The yeah. needs are so high and we don't address the needs as opposed to, you know, here in, I mean, you know, everything is great with Boston, with, with the exam schools and the pilot schools and how they operate. But you look at our neighbor, you look at our open enrollment high schools, they have the highest need students, you know, with the most need, but yet you don't always get the resources. And so you're juggling between, do I get a counselor or do I have a math teacher? Well, MCAS, I mean, as, assessment, school accountability isn't going anyplace. So no, what do you do? Well, social emotional, so social emotional effects go out the window, which is what these kids need. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah. And so these are things. So you know, you're caught in a conundrum. Yeah. Every single day, every single week, month, and year about what to do, and it's always well. These schools are terrible. Well, no, it's about why are they always concentrated in X number of schools in yeah. X number of school districts in X number of urban centers across the country? Yeah. It's so that that's where the inequities fall. And, you know, we and, you know, accountability, I believe in accountability. Don't make no mistake about that. Yeah, I would yeah, feel yeah. that testing is important, but testing shouldn't be a determinant on no. on, a, on a student's level or a school's ability to to operate. And so those are some of the inequities that I see that are just still going on today. And and it's so unfortunate. And it's just so unfortunate. And the kids and their families are the ones who pay the price. Well, they they're the first ones who pay the price, but eventually everybody pays the price. They pay the price. Gary, the whole community, the communities pay the price. Everyone, the economic development of, yep. of cities, yep. because if you don't yep. have an informed and educated workforce, you got nothing. What, what do you got? Yeah, you got nothing. So we don't have a, a diverse educational workforce because of the uh, lingering effects of uh, 1954. Well, that's, I wouldn't say that, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm yeah. sure there's, there's, there's a number of other factors well, of course. that go into that, but that's, but that's an important, I think it's an important one that goes overlooked. At times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's always going overlooked. I never even heard it said before. It's, uh, well, then of course, then we had busing here in Boston oh my, in the oh early my 70s. Lord. Oh my that Lord. was, uh, and yes, I mean, the effects are still, still going oh, on absolutely. today. Of course they are. How many, and we're, we're talking, what's that, 47 years ago? <laughs> 47. 70, 73, was it? 73. Yeah, yeah. And you're still feeling <laughs> the effects of this. And it's something when we talk about inequality and inequities. I mean, it's just, it's 2020. And we, we haven't figured this out. And we can't keep pointing the finger at each other. No, how do we come together with some solutions? And solutions are, are it's just, it's a team effort. I mean, there's a, there's a 2010 documentary, and I'm sure everyone waiting for Superman. As a matter of fact, I just saw it again the other day. I mean, Superman isn't showing up. There isn't one educator in this country. I don't care how good they think they are. Yeah. One person is not just going to come in and be the panacea for all education in one district, one state, or the entire country. It yeah. is a team effort that's going yeah. to really tackle this. 2020 brought unique challenges to all schools. But a few of our partner schools work with students who struggle with the traditional school setting, even when in-person learning is an option. Pace Academy in New Hampshire works with students not just to improve their education, but to help the whole student grow and learn. Jorge Santana, the executive director of the Pace Career Academy Charter School in Pembroke, New Hampshire, explained their philosophy in our June podcast. Um, so I think the number one thing is just A, its size. So we focus on um, the schools will not get bigger than 60 students. Um, and I think that the other piece is our ability to be able to individualize education. Um, so we, because of our sizes have very small um, class sizes, we're able to integrate a lot more project-based learning. And we also integrate workforce readiness, um, which includes internships, job exposure, um, and different pieces um, in that sense. 
that's kind of the uh, the core uh, of the school. And then what we've been developing as well is realizing and understanding the whole child and that our young people need more support sometimes than just the academic piece. And we've been able to set up a structure here that we're able to provide, go out into the community and support our young people in the community as well. And we run groups here, life skills groups, you know, ranging anything from conflict resolution to handling relationships uh, to being able to, you know, work on a budget. And again, the being able to individualize what each student needs is what sets us apart. I feel that uh, all youth are at risk, especially adolescents. And I think that it just resources can mitigate that risk. And one thing that I did find in New Hampshire is that resources are sparse. I now know why there's no taxes up here. But with no taxes comes no support. Um, there's no public transportation, you know, a lot of those pieces. When I came up here, the demographics are very different than what I was used to working with. And I honestly, when I remember when I first walked in to meet all of the students here, I was like, they're not going to get my jokes. Like, um, they're not going to be able to understand. And that wasn't the case at all. I felt like I knew them. I knew what they were kind of going through and what they were struggling with. And that, you know, was one of, to me, those uh, light bulb moments that made me realize that it's a lot to do with socioeconomic as well. Um, and that, you know, a lack of resources, whether it's rural or inner city, plays out the same way. And, in, you know, in some ways, I find it even more challenging in, in rural areas, you know, one of the biggest challenges I have right now is just transportation. I could get all of my young people amazing opportunities, but if they can't afford to get to the opportunities, then um, you know we're not able to actually have them take advantage of them. What we're finding is that I get young people who come here for a variety of reasons, anywhere from not uh, getting the necessary one-on-one -on -one attention that they need at their uh, district schools, from being, you know, bullied um, and not feeling safe to, you know, wanting to be able to have close relationships um, with the staff um, where they weren't able to get that at a bigger, at a bigger district school. And we have found that um, our young people are responding very well and our families are also. You know, I think I see a lot of the times how draining, it's not just on the young people when their school placement's not working, but it's, it's a big drain on the families as well. It raises stress and it causes a lot of conflict. And, you know, when the young person starts to respond very differently, I can just see the parents like shoulders go down. It has this really positive effect on the whole kind of a family. Um, so yes, I do think that our students are benefiting. When I started the school, I had about 18 students enrolled at the time. I ended the school year last year with a wait list for the, the first time in the history of the school. And right now I have a list of young people that are waiting to start with us on April 15th. Um, and I'm sure that we'll end the school year this year um, with a wait list as well. Um, so there's, um, there's definitely an awakening to the opportunity. Um, and I think it was just due to lack of information and misinformation um, about what a charter school is and what can it provide. Our July podcast featured our partner school, Kingsman Academy in Washington, D.C., as they established a new educational model for their at-risk student population. Kenesha Kelly, co-founder and executive director of Kingsman Academy, explained in a presentation to the D.C. Public Charter School Board that the school needed to institute a competency-based educational plan in order to best serve their student population. Our proposed competency-based academic program is an evidence-based alternative to a traditional Carnegie unit credit earning system. In a Carnegie-based credit earning system, the goal is for all students to progress through course content on pace with their age and grade level cohorts. Because the system is time-based, students are expected to move through course content at a standardized pace, even if the student knows the material and is ready to move ahead, or if the student does not fully understand concepts and skills and needs additional time to learn the material. 
within our proposed competency-based credit earning system, time is not the driving factor in whether students are in credits. Instead, the focus is on whether a student has demonstrated proficiency on critical course concepts at each phase of post-secondary readiness and is ready to move on to the next level. Students have multiple opportunities and ways to demonstrate proficiency. Students have voice and choice in teaching and the learning process. More importantly, the proposed academic program allows Kingsland Academy to create multiple pathways to graduation and post-secondary readiness with real-time progress monitoring along the way. While teachers can be creative and innovative in how to teach students and meet the needs of students within the framework, Kingsman Academy has direct access to a team of national experts and a partnership with Marzano Academies to make sure the school remains consistent in what is taught, how competency-based units will be earned, and how students will demonstrate competency in courses. Transitioning away from a Carnegie system will provide Kingsman Academy the flexibility in the ways that a student can earn credit and allow students to work on skills, content, and knowledge at their current level and individualized pace, regardless of their age, academic history, prior academic performance, or disability status. The proposed charter amendment will allow Kingsman Academy to implement our academic model with fidelity and better respond to the identified needs of our targeted population. Based on their research and experiences in the first years after Kingsman Academy's founding, Ms. Kelly determined the Marzano approach to competency-based learning was the best approach in helping their students find success. Um, to, to Shannon's earlier point, we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how do we design an academic program to meet the needs of our students. Uh, we engaged in a pretty robust strategic planning process where we interviewed uh, students, uh, staff, and families. Uh, we collected survey data, we analyzed um, historical academic data, and really talked to our students about what they needed in an academic program. Um, once we had a good sense of what we needed, uh, we, spe we spent quite a bit of time doing research to identify sort of the best framework that we could use to implement our program. Um, and we reached out to Marzano uh, Research just to engage them in our ideas, and that initial conversation um, really led us to, to realize that the alignment um, in terms of the values of uh, Marzano Academies um, and at the time Marzano Resources, uh, it was in direct alignment to what we needed to provide to our students and our families. Um, and it was just the basic components that we were trying to solve for as a school. So how do we engage students uh, who, who may not adhere to, to sort of these traditional norms around school engagement? Um, how do we make sure that we have a learning management system to track student progress along the way? Um, how do we, we identify critical course content um, that students need in, in order to progress? And then within that, how do we make sure we have a system in place, not just for accountability, but make sure our staff receive the training that they, they needed? Um, there are a lot of frameworks that are out there around competency-based, uh, but Marzano Research has been doing this work uh, for years, and they, they've really laid the foundation for what it needs to look like if a student, if a school implements a competency-based model will. Uh, and they really check the boxes off in terms, of, in terms of what we were looking for. JFY Networks continues its mission to engage and assist all involved in the education process to find and use best practices for teaching and learning in hybrid, remote, and in-person environments. If you have any questions or comments, please navigate to our website, jfynet.org, which features a wealth of commentary, dialogue, and free resources, including this monthly podcast, to support all educational communities. We would like to thank everyone who contributed to our podcasts in 2020, and we look forward to presenting more important and relevant topics each month during 2021. Thank you for joining us. For JFY Networks, I'm Greg Cunningham.